Shabbat Shalom, and welcome to Congregation Yeshua Tzio. Let's open in prayer. Lord God, we thank you for Purim, for your Moedim. Baruch Atah Adonai Ha'el HaKadosh. Praised are you, Adonai, Holy God. Baruch atah Adonai harotzeh b'tishuva. Praised are you, Adonai, who welcomes repentance. Baruch atah Adonai, chanun hamarbeh lisloach. Praised are you, Adonai, gracious and forgiving God. Thank you. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky shows his handiwork. Day to day they speak, night to night they reveal knowledge. There is no speech, no words, where their voice goes unheard. Their voice has gone out to all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In the heavens he pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his bridal chamber. It is like a strong man rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other end. Nothing is hidden from its heat. The Torah of Adonai is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of Adonai is trustworthy, making the simple wise. The precepts of Adonai are right, giving joy to the heart. The mitzvot Adonai are pure, giving light to the eyes. The fear of Adonai is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of Adonai are true and altogether righteous. They are more desirable than gold, yes, more, more than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and keeping them, there is great reward. Hallelujah. Your, your word is very pure, therefore your servant loves it. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Shabbat, the gift that you've given us a day to worship and come together and praise and honor you and your Shabbat. Quiet our hearts that we might enter into worship today. Thank you so much for the privilege to come together in your presence. Yeshem Yeshua HaMashiach. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah. Shabbat Shalom, Chag Sameach. Today is a special Shabbat, Shabbat Zachor. It means the Sabbath of remembrance. It's not that God forgot something, but it means that God acted. And that's really what uh, remembering is all about. Not only that you recall something, but you do something. So there's a special reading from that in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 7 to 19 talking about the descendants of Amalek. Also, we have um, in this portion, this is the eighth portion of Exodus, the 20th portion of the Torah. So if you're counting and keeping with us, we're a little more than one-third through the Torah. And this portion in a three-year cycle is actually divided into three portions because the rabbis feel it's so important. It is divided into 2720 to 28 at the end of 28 and then you have chapter 29 being one whole portion and chapter 30 verses 1 to 10 that's when we have a three-year cycle which in my understanding that's what Yeshua did in his time the three-year cycle 
And I only bring that up because of how important this whole passage, this whole Torah portion is. If you're going to continue to talk, would you please step outside? Thank you. It's okay. There's chesed. So um, one of the things that we want to learn from this is simply that the Lord does wondrous things, and he's commanded us to keep certain commandments. One of the things, uh, this t portion is called Tetzaveh, and it begins with simply talking about the near tamid, uh, uh, everlasting light that would be lit, and how the oil would come about for that. And if you've heard some of this before, I know this may seem repetitive, but I think it's very good, so I will repeat some of it. Um, the oil came to be because it was crushed. The olives were simply crushed, and in order to be crushed, they mean there was an amount of pe pain involved. And sometimes our pain brings the same kind of blessing of things that God wants to bring an everlasting light to. And the Neratami that we have on our ark is there every week. It represents that everlasting light. It was the idea that the cloud always followed them. Yeshua had the same experience when he was in the Garden of Gatshamani, which is the Garden of Gethsemane. It was actually a place where olives were pressed. There was olive groves there. And it said in Luke chapter 22 that as Yeshua prayed, he began to bring forth sweat and blood as he prayed. Some pretty powerful prayers. And then in verse 21, we have Aaron being commanded to order the lights. Another picture of Yeshua in the book of Revelation. Yeshua is standing among seven lights, it tells us, or seven men or wrote, however you want to look at it. It's the same idea that he's standing in front of seven lights, just as the lights Aaron stood of, of the menorah. And so as we look at the text and we get into the other three chapters, chapter 28, chapter 29, and the first 10 verses of chapter 30, and I've said this before, there's constantly these garments that are talked about and how they're to be made, how they're to dignify the priest, how the priest is to look special because of the garments. And I love how the priest is ordered. And one of the things I love about this whole passage is there's a sense of sensory overload at times. When you were in the tabernacle or the mishkan, there were things that you might have felt because it was open. We are in a very cozy, warm building. But in the mishkan, there might have been wind. There might have been sun, and you got, would get hot. There might have been smells to smell, like the incense burning, or the altar crackling with fire. There would have been sights to see, the everlasting fire or the menorah always shining. There would have been things to hear. As the priest walked, you'd hear his bells, the high priest, over and over again. You'd hear that. And a lot of times that's something you really can't capture from the text. It's more, there's more to it. And most importantly, yes, I did mention smell. And I'll mention it again because in Isaiah chapter 11, it says God will judge by the way he smells. It's very powerful factory sense. In fact, it's the most powerful, we're told. That it always will do things that it brings back wondrous memories to us. But as the priest was clothed, he, he wore, there were different pieces of garments. Part of it was he was always to be a person considering Israel and praying for Israel. There were 12 stones set in the breastplate and two uh, almost stones that were in his, uh, his breastplate to help him remember to pray for the children of Israel. And I recall this in terms of what we see in the New Testament in Ephesians 6, where we're told about the, the armor of God. There are six specific pieces there of which God tells us to clothe ourselves with and to stand firm and be faithful. And in that end, it most says, importantly of all, to pray, to pray. And in verse 30, which I'll get to in chapter 30, I should say, we're going to be looking at the whole idea of the altar of incense. 
In chapter 29, we have the ordination of the Kohanim, how they're to be ordained and to come into the priestly office, and how there's to be uh, blood put on their ear, the right ear, on their right thumb, and on their big toe of their right foot. And this is done to, so that they will hear the Lord, they will do what the Lord tells them, obey, and to walk with the Lord. This is very clear from the Haft Torah this week because it's a special Haft Torah in which Samuel rebukes Shaul. It's from 1 Samuel 15. This passage is very, very uh, stout, not a necessarily great passage to listen to because it's talking about the things that Saul did wrong. And one of the verses that really stuck out as I read this morning was verse 11. It talks about how Samuel prayed all night after the Lord told him he would reject Saul. All night long. And I sometimes think, boy, we can't even pray one hour sometimes without getting distracted. Or, and it's something that's very clearly established here is that he prayed all night for Shaul, for Saul, King Saul. And then we see the crux of the matter down in verse 22, because he wasn't willing to fully accept the Lord's authority in every area. And so this passage is hugely important. It also speaks of authority in the passage where it talks about how everything that comes and touches the altar is holy. Yeshua addressed this too in Matthew chapter 23, where he said, don't you know that everything that's in the temple is holy? Everything that touches the altar is holy? He says, you guys make these big deals out of the small stuff, and you don't hang on to the big stuff, the major stuff. Not putting them aside, the little things, but doing both, and doing the major ones more importantly. We talked about this in membership this last week. Finally, I'll end with the altar of incense. It's pictured throughout the Bible. Incense was burned in many religious ceremonies dating back to Egypt and probably even further. But the whole point is that wasn't done to the Lord. And the altar that's made here is to be done for the Lord. And there's some very neat instructions about it. In fact, many of the instructions we see in the Haftorah for Tetzaveh from Ezekiel 43, they seem very similar, how atonement is to be made for the altar, how it's supposed to have horns on it, how it's supposed to be squared, just like this altar is. But this altar has a very specific thing. It says, don't put any strange incense on it. Don't put any burnt offerings on it. Don't share any grain offerings with it or drink offerings. It was supposed to be a very special altar for the Lord for prayer. And your prayers on the heavenly altar, as it tells us in Revelation 8, verses 1 to 5, are what are offered with much incense on the same golden altar in heaven. And so it's a very, very great picture, this whole Torah portion. It's beautiful. It's one of my favorite, or it's become, I should say, one of my favorite Torah portions because of all it has to share. Prayer is to always go with us, wherever we go, just like the altar had staves to carry it. Prayer has to be done for many things. And I want to say one little commercial here. Some of you are praying this week, and I want to thank everyone who took the time to pray. But most importantly, I want to say, if you heard something special from the Lord, and you'd like to share that, please send it. Please let us know about it. It's always beautiful to hear how the Lord spoke to people during this past week. One of the things he said very clearly to me was simply this. We still have not seen all that the Lord wants to bless us with. This building is just the beginning. There's so much more that the Lord wants to give us and bless us with. Do you guys know that? It's, we're just on the cusp of it, but we still have a lot of work to do and a lot of things that God wants us to prepare for. 
So I pray that you read this whole portion. It's only two chapters and 12 verses. And that God will bless you as you read and study his word. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you how it comes to us and blesses us. We pray, Lord, that it, as it does, we will remember you. We will be drawn closer to you. And Lord, help us to take prayer in everything we do and everything we say to have that attitude. And as the priest was clothed, Lord, let us too be clothed with the things that it says in Colossians 3, 12 to 14. Clothing ourselves with compassion, tender mercies. Clothing ourselves with meekness and humility. Forbearing with one another and forgiving one another, just as Messiah forgave us. And most of all, put on love. Thank you, Lord, for these wonderful verses that you want your priesthood to be clothed in, Lord. We give you much honor and glory, B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. All right, so please, if you would turn to your, uh, in your Bible to Psalm 124, one of the Psalms of Ascent. The title of the message is, Where is God When You Need Him? Psalm 124, verse 1. A song of ascents of David. Had Adonai not been on our side, let Israel now say, had Adonai not been on our side when men rose up against us, then they would have swallowed us alive when their wrath burned against us. Then the waters would have engulfed us. The torrent would have swept over our soul. Then the raging waters would have swept over our souls. Blessed be Adonai who has not given us as prey for their teeth. Our soul has escaped like a bird out of the snare of the trappers. The snare is broken and we escaped. Our help is in the name of Adonai, maker of heaven and earth. All right, so we'll have this. Um, a little late today, so just relax. I won't be, I won't be super long, but we'll, we'll see. Um, just a couple of a couple of things before the message, even as you mentioned that the, the we we have moved completely into the the new facility. So I know you got an email, and hopefully you got an email. But if you're sending anything to the office, mail-wise, uh, in terms of mail, or some, some people send checks to the office, we still encourage that. That's great. Um, use the new address. Just don't use the old address. Uh, we do have a forward. It will forward, supposedly, but I, I don't know how your experience has been with the post office. We've always had trouble with forwarding. Even we moved a suite. We moved down the sidewalk. There was trouble. So uh, I wouldn't guarantee that. And some people that used to come and drop, you know, uh, checks and things in our exterior mailbox. Uh, don't do that anymore, because that mailbox isn't ours anymore. But we have the pretty much the same, actually the exact same mailbox uh, type on our new building. So you can go by there and drop something into that mailbox if you would like. Uh, I may or may not be there. There is a doorbell, but uh, you know, never know if, if I can come answer the door and that kind of thing, but you can drop something in there. So we are fully moved out of there. That was a big Big project, even for a small little office that we moved. And so I do want to thank Joanne Espinay, who helped a lot with it. She had other helpers with her. Uh, we had a moving company as well, but she had other people, Tracy and, and Deborah and other folks had come to, to help her. And so it is a team effort, even at the new building. Um, we need prayer for that because there is a lot to do. There is a, there is a lot to do over there when it comes to all of the, the settling in. And there's a lot of planning that goes on before something happens. But it gets exciting, just like with, like Barry said, all of a sudden we're going to start tearing walls down. All of a sudden it seems like something's moving. But trust me, a lot has been happening, I won't say in the heavenlies, yes, in the heavenlies, but in the, in, in the, the thought process. There's lots of thinking that goes on ahead of time. Uh, so thanks to, to Bob for, for the help with that, for, for spearheading that, for Ellen, for Aaron, for Chris Mounier has been over there some. We've little figuring out little idiosyncrasies with the building. I mean, like we had to get our refrigerator hooked up with water so we can, you know, 
use the water. And thank you, Chris, for that. just little things like that. Um, and for Barry and for w uh, Willie and Irene. I know some of you have talked with Willie and Irene about different ideas. And there's lots of ideas and lots of things that we, we talk about. And there's things we're going to do, things we'd like to do, things we can do, things we can do later, things we won't be able to do. And so patience and prayer and chesed is all needed for, for that. Um, so today I'm, I'm going to I'll go through this as quickly as I can, as reasonably as I can, so we can then do a little fellowshipping upstairs, uh, Psalm 124. Before I get to that, uh, the, you may or may not be familiar, I'm not going to do a thorough teaching on Purim today, uh, but it will be part of the message, and so I'm glad that, that what you saw what was represented up here, and hopefully most of you are familiar with the Purim story, won't go over, go over all of it, or all of the tradition that goes along with, with Purim. Obviously, there's costumes, which my favorite costume of all always is the one over there in the corner. Uh, that's always my favorite costume. Um, you understand the joke, don't you, you, you folks from, not from this country? You understand the joke about the blind referee? Okay, good. I just want to make sure. I just want to make sure. Some, sometimes I have to explain things uh, to people. But anyways, it's great. So, um, so poor him also with the groggers, you know, the... Every time you hear the, the name, we try to drown it out. On one hand, I think it brings more attention to his name. However, that is the tradition, that we were drowning out the name of, of the evil one there. So uh, looking at Psalm 124, since we are looking at Psalms, we'll, uh, there, there, uh, I was going to mention some things about what we talked about last week, but I'll, I'll skip over that. You can go online and watch about Psalm 22. But in Psalm 124, there's uh, a lot of vivid pictures in Psalm 124 to, to bring home the understanding of just how close a total disaster had loomed for the psalmist. This was uh, one of the, if you remember the, 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 when I talked about the psalms in the past, and certainly when we did one, Psalm 126, the song of, Songs of Ascent, I talked about some of the themes of those psalms, and this is one of the ones I, I had mentioned, the theme in this one being, you know, had God not been on our side, what would have happened to us? And so again, we have a number of these images of what would have happened to the psalmist if God had not been on, on Israel's side. And the psalmist here talks in verse 2 about how uh, against us they would have risen men, just a general reference to men having risen against us, Adam. Uh, that is, I think, a certain reality in life, certain meaning for sure, uh, that things will rise against us in, in the collective of men, humanity. That could be referring to any number of times when the Jewish people were sought out for persecution or destruction throughout history, biblically and otherwise, uh, but certainly in this, in this psalm, it's talking about things that would have happened in, in, the, in Bible, biblical times. So it's not referencing any one particular historical event necessarily. Therefore, I think it's as equally applicable to whatever our life circumstances are even today to consider, what are we gonna do? What would have happened had God not been there when things and men rise up against us? These men, the text says, having risen up against us, would have swallowed us alive, is what the text says, had it not been for God. It says, Chaim Belaunu, uh, alive would have swallowed us, swallowed us whole. I remember years ago, uh, and you may have seen this, you may not remember, but in the Pinocchio story, uh, there's a scene where you know, Pinocchio gets swallowed by a whale. And so I remember, uh, we, we had just Soph and Zach at the time. They were little, and they, they had watched that, that video or the little cartoon. And the next day, I remember Sophia was, was kind of sad. She was in tears because she had had a dream about That's pretty, you know, graphic <laughs> image there. She had a dream about that. And she said, no, would, Zach was in, was in the water, and then a whale came, and then Zach was gone. There was no more Zach. It was so sad. She, in her mind, there was her dream. There was no more Zach. It would have been sad. And the same thing with, with the, the psalmist's depiction here. The idea is that if it weren't for God, if it hadn't been for God, that the enemy would have done away with us and the, the Israel here very quickly. One gulp out of nowhere, just down in an instant. That's the picture. Just whoop, no more Zach. Um, same with us. Just minding our business in our boat, I think, in life, bobbing along sometimes, not knowing what's looming in the depths 
underneath, ready to swallow us whole. That's a reality. Yet the Lord is and the Lord was there now in the past and in the future. And then in verses 4 and 5 are the, the images of what I'll call overpowering chaos over the entire being, over one's entire nefesh, your entire living being, just chaos, like the image there of raging waters that, that can't be stopped. I think I've told this story before, but many years ago I went whitewater rafting. I've probably been a few times. I mean, there's the Colorado River here, of course, but in, in Maryland and in Virginia, West Virginia, there's, there's rivers, and you can go whitewater rafting and tubing. But I went whitewater rafting. I had done it before, uh, and I went with... The first time I went, I believe I went with, I'll call them responsible adults. And so when you are in the boat and you've got the guide and the guide says, right side, forward, left side, I mean, you do what they say and you get through the rapids. I mean, you get through because they tell you what to do. Well, this time I was actually, I was with this, this church group out of Virginia and I was, work, I was there with the teens and the teens were there and that's just not my thing. And, uh, and the teens weren't as cooperative and they were just there for fun and we did this thing where you came off a rapid and you you spun around you go back into the rapid where the water's falling off the rock and they called it surfing Woo, fun surfing you go in and you surf into this thing and you're, but you're supposed to do what you're supposed to do with the paddles and I was in the front of the boat and the water was coming off the rock and just hitting us hard and filling us up and it felt like it was it sort of pins you in there in this surfing maneuver and you're supposed to do something with the oars and I'm doing what I'm supposed to do and these kids in the, in the other side in the back are just, eh, they're all having fun. And I looked at my other buddy who was, who was with me, who was also the chaperone or whatever, and I thought, well, this is it. Like, we're gonna, I'm gonna die because the water was coming in and it wasn't shutting off and I got bumped out of the boat and I thought, well, that's it. The water's gonna hold me into the rock and I'm, that's it. Well, it, fortunately, it spit me down the river and my day was kind of ruined. Um, but, you know, again, it sort of turned out okay, but the realization that I had there is kind of this picture. Of the, I think that, the, that no one, I realized quickly, no one's going to shut the water off. Like, that water can't be shut off. It's coming down from somewhere. However, if anyone could have shut it off, it would have been God. And that's the message of this psalm. If it had not been, the raging waters would have done that. And that's the picture. There. Then you've got verse 6, a picture once again of the enemy's attack. But this time, not a fast gulp like before, like no more Zach. Uh, no, the image here is of something slow, aggressive, and painful. The text talks about the idea of being given to the teeth of the enemy. You can picture the image kind of of a slow, enjoyable meal. This is not a, a gulp. This is a slow, aggressive, painful, enjoyable meal. The enemy frankly, would love to satisfy his appetite with you, with us. And there may be a continual enemy that you have, I don't know. Could be a, a habit, could be an addiction of some kind, could be a, a weakness of some kind, something that continues to crouch and wait for you, trying to lure you in, into its mouth, into the enemy's mouth to be chewed up. And maybe it's something that you even venture in there from time to time. <laughs> However, the Lord has ultimately not, as this text tells us, given us as prey for the enemy's teeth, for the satisfaction of the enemy's appetite. And then finally, verse 7, the release, the picture of a release from an actual trap, a snare for a bird. And the trap is, and the trap was designed, that type of trap to be, and traps are, uh, to be more restrictive the more one struggles. That's the idea of a bird and a snare. It gets even more entangled and trapped the more it struggles. But then again, the picture there that the Lord released the trapped one. And then verse 8 is really the true answer to the question of how this deliverance came about, how this potential disaster was averted, how, had not the Lord been there, things would have been different. And it says... Which is, our help, our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. In the name, in the name of the Lord. The idea of in the name of, and I've, I've said this before, name is a very powerful thing in the Bible. Names are very powerful things in the Bible. 
I, I, I worked in the, the, the uh, what is it, the, the <laughs> my mind is going blank, managing residential apartments, and I see names all the time. It, some of these names, I don't know where people come up with these names, and they've got, some of these names have what we call bling in them sometimes, little apostrophes and things, and like name bling and names that you've never heard before. But names in the Bible aren't like that, like what sounds good or what looks good. It's names mean something. And the name where it says here, B'Shem Adonai, Oseh Shemayim it's is not, not about the pronunciation of God's name. That's a whole other thing. People want to talk about how do we pronounce God's proper name. Uh, that's not what name is about. God's name, whether it's the cr uh, correct pronunciation of yod heh vav he, it, it's not like a magic phrase or a password. In fact, if you read in the book of Acts, chapter 19, you see this band of Jewish exorcists that go around and say, I, you know, they want to cast out demons in the, in the name of Yeshua that Paul preaches. They think the name is the important thing. Name is a lot deeper than just name or how a name is pronounced. It has to do with the substance of what's behind the name, the substance of the person. And the idea here in verse 8 is that the help depicted in this psalm has to do with, not the quote name of God, but has to do with God and who he is. And we'll see that very vividly in next week's parasha, where Moses wants to know God better, to see his glory, to see what sets God apart. And in response, God goes before Moses and declares his name. And, and he does declare his name. He says, Adonai, Adonai, Yodhevave, Yodhevave. But it's not really about his name. He goes on to, to talk about who he is and his characteristics. And that was God's response to Moses wanting to know him better. That's in Exodus 34. And so the reality and the imagery of this psalm, hopefully you see it's pretty powerful, but it connects, as do other psalms, to what we see in the book of Esther, Ta -da, Purim. Uh, we see how, how Haman's plotting and planning was absolutely reversed in an instant. Like the picture of the bird, for example, being released from the snare in this psalm. How the Lord worked miraculously on behalf of the Jewish people in the face of seemingly impossible odds. And what would have been the case? You know, on Purim, there's a, there's a lot of traditions. I said I won't go over all of them. There's one, one tradition. There's a big piece of liturgy read uh, in, in, the, in the Siddur, and it's called the Krovetz. Krovetz. Krovetz is not an actual Hebrew word. It's an acronym made up of other Hebrew words. Uh, the Hebrew words for uh, Kol Rina, the Yeshua, Beohele, Tzadakim. The sound of rejoicing and salvation is in the tents of the righteous, is what that acronym that we get Krovetz sounds for, uh, named for, because Purim is a legit celebration. Hopefully you figured that part out. Sometimes people say, Happy Yom Kippur, or something like that. It's like, well, that's not really the one where we're like, yay, Yom Kippur, and we're having a party. But Purim is a legit happy celebration, um, because, it, because it is, because God's people are celebrating his deliverance, God's deliverance through the, the hero and heroine, Esther and Mordechai, hopefully God himself as well. They are, actually. One of the, the stanzas in this liturgy, there's, again, there's a lot of them. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll read some next year. I don't know. We'll, we'll have time, and it'll be a Monday. It won't be during a Shabbat. We might read some of the stuff in the Chovetz, which is kind of cool. Um, but here, there's a stanza in there that says, she, this is speaking of Esther, says, she came to the king with eyes raised to God without realizing that the hand of God had acted. And so the rabbis, in writing this, I think, realized the truth, not just of the book of Esther, but what we also see in this psalm, and what we see in our lives for those of us who trust in and follow the Lord. The truth that answers the question, what I put in my sermon title, of where is God when you need him? And as, as seen in this line from the Krovetz in, in Psalm 124, and the book of Esther, and in other places as well, biblically, God, the answer to the question of where is God when you need him is that he's already there. He's already two steps ahead. And I want to take a slight detour to the other side, however, of this equation of where is God you need him, that he's already working there. And we see that in the Purim story. We see it other places as well. We see it, for example, in the book of Numbers. Um, Balaam and Balak, you know, the, the Jewish people have no idea that, that this king is trying to, to, to get this Balaam to curse Israel. They had no idea that was going on. 
Yet God was protecting them and doing these things multiple times, three times, speaking to Balaam to not allow him to curse but to bless Israel. So we see this uh, in many cases. But even, what I want to do is take a slight detour to the other side of the equation, the side of the Purim story that is the what I'll call the opposition side. Because we're looking at, oh, God's side. We understand God's side. But this is the part of our psalm that, or part of what the psalm would call the Adam that rises up against us. So even though we never consider ourselves, I think, on that side of the equation, we always want to think everyone's against us, what's God doing for us, I believe there are always good things we can glean and learn from looking even at that negative side of the equation, that we would never be the enemy, we would never be the opposition, we would never be that side of the equation, but let's look at it anyways. It is in Scripture. In the Purim story, we, Purim story, we see the villain, we see the enemy, the one who, like Psalm 124 says, rose up against us. We all know who that is. On the one hand, the villain, Haman, he had it all. Really, when you, when you look in, in the book of Esther, you look in chapter 3 of Esther, it says, he comes out of nowhere, basically. It says that he was raised up by the king. It says he was greatened by the king. He got promoted, basically. And why is that? Why did he get promoted? It doesn't say. It just comes out of nowhere. But I think we, can, we could reasonably conclude that, that he was obviously very skilled, he was very gifted in some way. He was raised up just like that and put in a very high position. But he did have some problems that ultimately led to his downfall. And we read in the text of, of Esther that he was filled with, with heat and he was filled with rage. And really, when you get into it later on, the same word there can be, can be translated poison, actually. Heat, rage, poison. So a few things that may have got him to that state. Number one, a uh, couple things, is he got stirred up by listening to the king's servants. That was part of it. They deliberately, the text reads, and I won't take the time to read into it now just because of time, the text says that they really wanted to test Mordechai, and they also were very specific in telling Haman that Mordechai was Jewish. So there seems to be some stirring up there. So, so Haman got stirred up by listening to that. Another thing I think that filled him with that heat and that rage and that poison is although he seemingly had everything, this person that was just out of nowhere just raised up and greatened by, by the king, clearly very gifted and talented, on top of the world, he was unfortunately focused on, even, even after having all that, he was unfortunately focused on the one thing that he didn't have, and that was namely deference from Mordecai, the Jew. And these two things, these two things, getting stirred up and then also focusing on just that one thing that he didn't have, those, those two things primarily led to his downfall. And I believe that just like with Pharaoh, that God was involved in that, just how God hardened Pharaoh's heart but also allowed Pharaoh to go in that predisposed uh, direction, I think that was the same with, with Haman. And because, we're, because I want to look at that side of the equation, I think that in a real way, we can learn from these two things also, these two things that were the downfall of, of, of the villain of, of the book of Esther. Number one is, you know, listening to things that might just stir us up. You ever get stirred up by stuff? Maybe other people. Maybe if you're like me sometimes, unfortunately, the news or other media outlets that are just stirring us up with stuff. So it could be directly from people. It could be... Again, like the news, it's not a good thing. And so we need to be careful, I think, listening to, to things other than the Lord, because that can truly be the precursor to a major, a major downfall, just how much we allow ourselves to get sucked into those kind of things. And then, of course, the other one, which I think is, is just as important, if not more, is focusing on, on that, that thing or those things that we don't have in life. That's easy to do. God's given us so much, though. And we need to avoid the, what I'll call the death trap of dissatisfaction or comparison to what's around you. And in Haman's case, it just ate him up inside. It literally filled him, like I said, with rage. It filled him with heat. It filled him with, with poison. And on the outside, there was Haman, a man of very high skill and obviously the power to go with it, plotting to destroy the Jewish people those that he saw as his enemy, because of his dissatisfaction with that one Jew who wouldn't bow down to him. And his threats were real. 
they were a true danger to the Jewish population. There was no way on their own that the Jews of Shushan would have been able to reverse what was already set in motion against them because of the, the rumors against them and the hatred that was kind of overnight directed at them. There was no way they were going to reverse that. Absolutely no way at all. And what the Jews needed at that moment was nothing other than, than God. And that's what they experienced. They experienced a complete, when you read the story, it's quick to read. You might think it's a lot of chapters I can't read. It's a pretty quick read. Uh, it's a complete reversal of circumstances. What looked to be really an imminent and a total disaster, when you think about how it transpired and just how much was against them, completely turned on its head overnight, literally. And I think the obvious application and the, and the obvious parallel of this, for me, is the, the Besorah, the good news, the gospel. When the Jewish followers of, of Yeshua thought that they had reached the end of the road, when what they thought would be total deliverance from Roman oppression and the establishment of the Messianic kingdom, they thought that was coming. That turned into the crucifixion of Yeshua. I think they thought that all, all had been lost. And however, though, I think you know, we know that just like the reversal in the story of Esther, and just like the reversal seen in Psalm 124, uh, God had other plans. Yeshua rose from the dead, illustrating his role as the, that perfect atonement and savior of his people. And so again, where is God when you need him? Well, as I mentioned, he's, he's working despite what it might look like. I mean, there are times, there are near-death experiences, there are times when you know you're in trouble, you know things are lurking, when trouble's lurking. When we know someone or something is out to get us, like in the, in the Purim story. And then there are other times, many other times, when we're just as precariously perched in harm's way and we don't know about it. Like that picture of the whale under the water or, or Balaam and Balak, what I talked about earlier in, in the book of Numbers. Not even aware that the danger is there, yet God intervenes. And in both cases, in the cases, whether you know and you don't know, God is there when you know that you need him and when you don't know that you need him. Either way, you rely on him. There really is no other effective way. And moreover, we need to rehearse, not just knowing that, we need to rehearse, as does the psalmist here, the truth that, God, that had God not been with us, had not God been for us, then, and you can fill in those blanks yourself, the blanks of your version of being gulped down or your version of being chewed up, <laughs> in the teeth of the prayer, your version of uh, those, you know, being overrun by those raging waters and torrents of life that you just can't turn off. No one's going to turn them off. Uh, this other week, uh, Jessica told me there's a little book. There's actually a library for, for the Jewish kids. It's a nonprofit, I think. They send books to Jewish kids for free. It's called the PJ Library. You may have heard of it before. They send all kinds of books. They send out a book, and uh, we've been getting them for years, and there's, there's one on this, this, this kid who's in Denmark during the time of World War II, and the German soldiers are just, just starting to come in, and it's a story about it. So Emmy was reading, she was reading this little book as part of her homeschool, and then uh, she kind of just innocently asked Jessica, who are the Nazis? Who are the Nazi? What's a Nazi? You know, just, just asking. Little did she know <laughs> who the Nazis, little did she know that if the Nazis had their way, there would have been no such thing as an Emanuela Katz asking that question, quite frankly. It just wouldn't happen. Just this last weekend, the, there were Jewish, you know, and some of you know about this, the Jewish communities in the U.S. Were, were gripped. I don't think anything came of it. I don't believe I heard of any attacks, but there was uh, a day of hate by neo-Nazi groups planning a day of hate, targeting Jewish people on the Shabbat. I don't think anything happened. But, you know, while, while the anti-Semitism of our generation, Dr. Dallaire talked about some anti-Semitism uh, things that were spoken about at Lausanne, they so far have stopped short of you know, governmental edicts like we see in the book of Esther. There are still acts of violence directed toward Jews. It's still a present reality. And there's violent acts against believers in general. It's not, this, is not a, this is not a foreign thing. And there are, there are still those things in the world that the enemy would love to see swallow us up, love to see chew us up, would love to see overrun us. And it literally happens all the time. And again, sometimes we know about it, and we're thankful for God's protection and deliverance, and other times, we'll never know about it. However, we, we need to be just as thankful. 
And this is part of why in Judaism we say a thing called the Shehechianu, the Shehechianu prayer. Shehechianu v'kiyamanu v'higianu l'azman hazeh. We say, thank you, Lord, for, for giving us life, for protecting us in that life in ways that we know, in ways that we don't know. That's implied. And then for bringing us to this very time and season. We often say that. That's the, the recognition of this idea that, God, we know if it weren't for you, we wouldn't have life. We wouldn't have made it to this very time. And as, as the great, I think, great comedian Jackie Mason would say, you know, what those things were, we don't know. But he would say it that way. The point is, there's something that came to get us. What it is exactly, we don't know. But we still say the Sheikh Yanu prayer. And so, as we think about Purim and, and the story of Esther during this time of year, let's also remember what the psalmist tells us in Psalm 124, that, that namely, like in Esther's time and in David's time and in our time, had Adonai not been on our side, we would have been toast. That's my translation. Is that past Dr. Blair? I don't know. Toast, okay. The accurate representation of the Hebrew, we would have been toast. Yet God is in fact on our side. Whether we, you know, whether we won't be eaten, we'll be released from the traps of the enemy, we'll be released by God, the maker of heaven and earth, and the one who came to earth died and rose again reversing for eternity the plans of the enemy for those who choose to put their faith in him. So let us pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for giving us life. We thank you for preserving us. We thank you for preserving us in those times that we know are bad and things are against us, and also those times that we have no idea how close we were to being swallowed up. We thank you for all of those times and allowing us to reach this very season in our lives personally, in our lives as a family, in our lives as a community of faith. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, help us to be thankful to you for protecting and delivering us at all times and help us to understand and to know the reality of how it is only through your name that we are rescued and that we are helped. It was just in Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Hey, everybody. This is your sound man. I've been asked to relay that the cleaning crew is short this week this week, and if you can chip in to help after service, that would be great. And you, that was quick, man. So we'll turn it over to Mr. Grant. Thanks for sticking in there. A few minutes over, and we'll close out and hopefully get cleaned up and a few things upstairs for you. Thank you, Rabbi David, for that awesome word. We're going to close with the ironic benediction found in Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. God commanded Moses and Aaron to put his name on the children of Israel with this benediction. Vichuneka Isadono Panavelecha Viosem Lecha Shalom Vishem Yeshua Hamashiach Sarah Shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he turn his face toward you and give you his shalom. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, the Prince of Peace. Shabbat shalom and Hag Sameach. <laughs>